hello uh, can everyone hear me clear and loud yeah yes yes <laughs> yeah thank you thank you um i may have a problem actually because the uh, the lecture will be streamed on youtube you said right Hello? Perché non so se ho il copyright di tutte le immagini. Quindi adesso devo fare un passaggio veloce. Aspetta. Uh, mi sa che questo salta. Mm, questo... Ok... Questo no. One minute, we'll be back here now.
Hello, good to see you. Hi. Hi, Zioni. Hi, Marco. Hello. Hi. Hi, Giovanni. Hi. Hello. Hi, So we have a. I, just, a sorry? Please, like, um, would you mind to confirm, like, you're going to, to record it and put it on YouTube, right? The lecture, the YouTube uh, thing is because uh, since morning uh, our internet connection has been a bit unstable. Uh -huh, okay, no, no, no. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that, but I had to cut two slides because I do not have the copyrights of the of the images, so I cannot use them for. Uh, but anyway, it, it doesn't affect uh, ah, the, the, YouTube the, the PowerPoint in total. But uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I just wanted to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Roy, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Is Roy there? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Yes, yes. Um, Hello everyone. So, Roy, you there? I do see him. Ah, okay, you see him. That's fine. Hi, I'm there. Ah, okay, yeah. Hello everyone. I should uh, a little caution uh, uh, right ahead that the internet connection at our end has been unstable since morning. So apologies for any interruptions halfway through, but therefore we have given a backup option of uh, telecasting this uh, live on YouTube in case some of uh, our end it's not working. Please try and switch off your video to the extent possible so that you know our bandwidth is not uh, compromised. And uh, I thank you so much Giovanni and Marco for agreeing to present to our uh, research group as part of our webinar series. Our project is uh, about reconstructing uh, a social history of mathematical practice in South India, especially in the Tamil and Malayalam speaking regions. And one of the integral parts of our study has been to identify hitherto ignored manuscript sources that speak about activities done by particular occupational groups that could have been mathematical. So that's largely the rubric under which we have been studying for the last three years and more. And uh, so in that context, we are very glad that we have been able to get in touch with you with the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures in Hamburg. Thanks to our friend Matthias, who has just joined there recently. And, uh, and hopefully during the course of our discussion, we will be able to find much more uh, stronger mutual concerns and how to go about it. So. Giovanni and Marco, it's over to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Marco Franceschini, and I will start this presentation. I will give the first half of this presentation. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I try to share my... Uh, Uh, Babu, maybe mute your end, please. Mute, mute.
can you see my presentation now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, just Roy, you want to say something? No, no, it was a mistake. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, over the last eight years, uh, Giovanni Ciotti and me have been working on the colophons found in manuscript manuscripts written in, in Tamil and Tamilian Granta scripts. The first outcomes of our research were presented in a, in a long article which was published in 2016. And the provisional conclusions contained in that article were based on a corpus of 45 uh, colophons. Since then, we have collected and examined a significant deal of new material and the number of colophons now included in our database amounts to over 900. Please note that in the context of the pre the, this presentation, uh, uh, and uh, in the context of our research at large, a colophon is a paratext containing information about the production, the storage, and the circulation of a particular manuscript. That is to say, colophons themselves, uh, but also borrowing statements, uh, lending statements, ownership statements, and so on. Uh, since the co these colophons are mostly composed by scribes, we also call them scribal colophons. Uh, what is our work like? Uh, basically, we uh, spot, transcribe, and edit the colophons, and then we collect, scrutinize, and arrange the information contained uh, therein. And what is our work for? Uh, our research is concerned with the archaeology of the handwritten book. In fact, the purpose of our work is to reconstruct the time and the place in which the manuscripts were produced, and also to shed light on the process of their production and circulation, as well as on the network of people who took part in it. So scribes, borrowers, owners, lenders, and so on. Uh, this presentation is split into two parts. Uh, my part will come first, and uh, after a short general, general introduction to our work, my presentation will be completely devoted to the dates, uh, which are found in the colophons. The second part of the presentation, uh, which will be given by Giovanni, focuses on what kind of questions concerning the history of the manuscripts can be asked from the point of view of computer science and material analysis on the basis of the patterns emerging from the analysis of the colophons. Uh, I begin my presentation with some general remarks about our corpus. I, uh, read from the slide. All the manuscripts uh, in our uh, corpus are pal palm leaf manuscripts and the texts are inside the, incised in, not drawn on, the leaves. Texts transmitted by the manuscripts are composed in the Tamil language, written in Tamil script, in Sanskrit, written in Granta script, and in Mani Prabalam, that is Sanskrit lexicon with Tamil morphosyntax. Colophons are composed in Tamil, in Sanskrit, in Mani Pravalam, or, most commonly, in a simple juxtaposition of words, Tamil words and Sanskrit words, almost without grammatical consistency and with very loose syntactic connection. In our corpus, all the combinations of the languages of composition of both the texts and the colophons are represented, with the only exception of a Tamil text with a Sanskrit colophon. This is to say that our colophons are, at the same time, multilingual and uh, multi-script. Uh, perhaps all of you know well, uh, very well, how a South, South Indian manuscript looks like. Uh, uh, I, I just show you a picture. Manuscripts we are working with are made up of piled up folios. Uh, they, are, they are usually protected by two wooden boards placed on top and on bottom of the 
file. Uh, the manuscripts are bound together in a bundle by, uh, uh, by a string, and the string is threaded through one or two holes, which uh, had been pierced previously through the folios and through the wooden boards. To read the book, of course, you have to flip the folios um, upward vertically. Uh, these are the overall figures of our research at present. At present, our database contains 910 colophons, which are found in 438 manuscripts. Uh, um, of these 910 colophons, 518 contain at least one date, 572 contain uh, the name of the scribe and 271 the name of the owner. Uh, please note that in this context, uh, uh, when I say a manuscript, I mean a bundle. So, uh, and also, um, and also note that a manuscript might contain more than one text. This is actually often the case. And in turn, a single text might contain one, can, can contain one or more colophons. Colophons are usually found at the end of a text, as in the two examples in the slide. Uh, sometimes they are also found at the uh, end of uh, sections of a text. And colophons can be extremely short, as the two shown in the slide. I have, trans I have transcribed the, the colophons in yellow in the slide, and you can see that they are very... Uh, Concise, and um, but they also can be quite long, as the one uh, I'm showing you now. Uh, in addition, colophons are often to be found on so-called guard leaves. That is, uh, leaves uh, which are inserted at the beginning and in the end of the manuscript to protect the folios uh, which uh, bear the actual text like here, like uh, the, the example shown in the, on top of the slide, or uh, they can, at times, the colophons are itched, are scratched on the wooden board. This is a, a less common case anyway, as uh, shown in the, on the top of the slide. Um, the manuscript in which our colophons are found are held in 16 different collections. 18 collections are located in India. Uh, they are marked in yellow in the slide. And all of them, as you can see, all of them are located in South India with the only exception of the uh, National Library in Calcutta. Uh, the remaining five collections are in Europe. Uh, however, in, a, in our database, the amount of manuscripts belonging to each collection differ, differ considerably. 75% of the total number is held, as you can see, in the uh, libraries of the two uh, French institutes in Pondicherry, so the, the Institut Français de Pondicherry and the Ecole Française d'Extrême-Orient, and 91% uh, um, of the total number uh, belongs to the first four collections in the list. Uh, why? Uh, the first four collections in the list are numerically prevalent because they have descriptive catalogues, at least partial de descriptive catalogues, or lists of some sort. This means that we can avail ourselves of these lists to spot out which manuscripts contain colophons, colophons and which don't. Actually, actually, this is true only to a certain extent because often the records, uh, in the records included in the catalogs and in the lists, uh, do not pay much attention to the colophons, and sometimes they uh, simply skip them. Still, this is far better than working on a collection without a catalog because in this case we are left with, with no other choice than to browse through all the folios of, of all the manuscripts 
in search of the colophons. Just to provide, uh, just to provide an approximate order of magnitude, we estimate that in average, colophons are to be found in around 40% of the manuscripts. Uh, let's see now what's inside the colophons. Uh, according to the results of our investigation, uh, the colophons tend to be internally organized into modules and, sub and submodules. Their content can be broadly represented, represented as shown in the slide. Um, the modules are... Uh, are written in, uh, on the left hand of the slide in yellow color. Uh, and on the right side of, this, of the slide, I have um, put uh, an example of a colophon, which the actual text contained in this colophon. Um, so for example, the, the, the colophon, uh, which I have used as an example, has a date, which is the first module, Shri Mukha Jovian Ear, Ani Month, Tenth Day, does not uh, state the name of the owner, but uh, it uh, includes the name of the scribe and the title uh, of the work transmitted with the copying formula, the text called uh, Siddhanta Saraswali was copied with his own hand, an invocation, honor to Meenakshi and Sundareshwara, an apologetic, apologetic formula, good people will forgive the mistake made by my hand, and uh, but there are no borrowing formula and the final invocation. And no need to, no need to say we do not find uh, all the modules in all the colophons, and the order of the modules is not rigid, so rigidly fixed. Uh, let's move on now to the dates, and this will be the topic of my presentation from now on. Uh, let's start with the diachronic distribution of our dates over the centuries. Uh, so far, our corpus contains uh, 500 18 dates, and around one third of them, 38%, uh, are indeterminable in the sense that they, that we cannot calculate their corresponding date in the Gregorian calendar. Uh, conversely, around two thirds of the dates, uh, 62%, can be safely converted into a date in the Gregorian calendar. Um, the indeterminable, indeterminable dates are uh, in turn uh, divided into cyclical dates and problematic dates. Um, dates are cyclical when they consist of just the Jovian year, the month and the day. Uh, the Jovian year uh, is sim simply consists, uh, the Jovian year cycle simply consists uh, consists of a series of 60 uh, solar years, each bearing a Jovian year name. Since the cycle starts anew at the conclusion of the last year of the series, the same year name recurs every 60 years. As a consequence, a date consisting of just the Jovian year, the month and the day is ambiguous because it recurs every 60 years. On the other hand, a date is problematic either because it is incomplete or because it contains uh, uh, contradictory elements, that is to say wrong values, uh, that prevent the calculation of its corresponding date in the Gregorian calendar. Uh, as I said, uh, around uh, two-thirds of the dates uh, can be converted into a date in the Gregorian calendar, and the century-wise distribution of these dates is shown in the slide. Uh, you can see the remarkable prevalence, preponderance of, the, of manuscripts written uh, in the 19th century. They, they account for more than three-fourths of the total. Um, our dates cover a time span of around three centuries. The earliest dated manuscript we have met so far was written in 1610, and the latest in 1916. Um, here you, uh, you can see which calendrical elements are in the dates and in which order they are arranged. 
uh, this is a list of the calendar called elements which can be found in a date together with their number of occurrences um, as a rule uh, dates contain only from three to eight of these elements uh, and the order of the elements in the dates is the one shown in the list the eight calendrical elements marked in yellow in the slide are the uh, main elements that is the elements who which recur far more fre frequently in the dates and they are as you can see column year jovian year the month usually the solar month sometimes the lunar month the, the day the day of the week the the paksha the fortnight the titi the, the day of the lunar month and the nakshatra which is the constellation um, of these eight elements the elements uh, from the column year to the day of the week are based on the apparent movement of the sun whereas the last three Pakshatiti and Nakshatra are based on the position of the moon in addition to these eight main elements occasionally our dates include other calendrical calendrical data as you can see on top of the list three years uh, uh, reckoned according to uh, other eras, namely the Shaka Salivahana, the, Ka the Kali and the Christian eras. And uh, on the bottom of the list, you can see, um, you can see some minor elements, uh, uh, which sometimes are also included in our dates, Yoga Karana, Lakshana, Vela and Mukurta. Um, <coughs> Although the eight main calendrical elements are those which occur more frequently in the dates, they, uh, they co-occur altogether in just 5%, 25 dates, that uh, are 5% of the total. Unsurprisingly, uh, the most frequent combination of calendrical element in a date is year plus month plus day which uh, which accounts for uh, more than one third of the total dates um sorry uh okay so um i now move on to the last part of my presentation uh before closing my presentation i uh wish to touch upon two features which are peculiar to the dates in manuscripts from Tamil Nadu, namely uh, symbols and abbreviations used to label some calendrical elements and the, uh, the rational numbers used to represent the values of some minor calendrical elements. Let's start with the uh, calendricals, so say the symbols and the abbreviations. Uh, in our dates, uh, the year, the month and the day are commonly, commonly labeled uh, by uh, specific symbols um, or abbreviations. In other words, these symbols are used in place of uh, specifying words such as column year, Jovian year, month, and day. Um, uh, in this example, the, the, the colophon uh, says uh, 1030, and then symbol for column year, and this uh, translates into column year 1030. Rakshasa, and then the symbol uh, for Jovian year. Sitirai, and then the symbol for month, 18, and then the symbol for day, and then the, uh, the remaining part of the colophon comes. Um, a paleographical study of these symbols and abbreviations, and abbreviations is in progress. It aims at collecting and interpreting all the symbols and abbreviations that have been in use over the centuries, and to ascertain the different period, periods during which each symbol has been in use. This latter information uh, could prove crucial for dating some manuscripts. Just for the sake of cur curiosity, I quickly show you some samples of these symbols. Note, please note, 
that at the best of my knowledge, most of the symbols that we have collected have never been recorded in any publication so far, and they are not included in the Unicode standard, not yet, at least. Uh, these are the symbols used for marking the column here. Uh, actually, they, uh, they developed uh, from one single original symbol. The, these are three, let's say, graphic variants of uh, one and the same uh, single uh, symbol. The, 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 the one circled in red is the earliest uh, attested uh, variant. Uh, this is the only one which is found in manuscripts from the 17th century. Um, by contrast, three different symbols are used for marking the Jovian ear. Um, at present, it seems that the only symbol attested in the 17th century is number two, the one circled in red, while number three seems to have been uh, in use only uh, since the middle of the 18th century onwards. And uh, there are five different symbols which were used to mark the month. Diachronically, the earliest attested symbols, uh, symbol is number three. Uh, as you can see in, in the slide. Um, it is perhaps worth noting that only the first uh, symbol, which is actually an abbreviation, um, used for month is uh, at present is accepted in the Unicode standard. And finally, the symbols for day, you know, these are not so significant because there are just two graphic uh, variants and they are quite similar. Uh, although the uh, B shape uh, is probably later than the A shape, the A shape, sorry. Uh, I move on now to my uh, last topic, that is the symbols uh, for rational numbers. Uh, Okay, uh, for months, Giovanni and I were puzzled by the identification of a handful of signs appearing in some dates. These signs occur very seldom, only in six dates, and this fact made more difficult for us to identify them. In the end, these symbols turned out to represent fractions. As you probably know, uh, Tamil fractions are identified by a name and are represented by a symbol. Um, you can see in this slide on the right hand the, the symbols that we excerpted from the manuscripts, uh, from the colophons, and on the right hand of the slide you can see a section of the Unicode, of the Unicode plan, because a few years ago 18 of these symbols for fractions um, were accepted, were included into the Unicode standard. Uh, what these rational numbers stand for in the, day, in the dates is not completely clear yet. Uh, since the fractions are always preceded by integers, my hypothesis is that the integers represent the Narigai, the so-called Indian hour, Gatika in Sanskrit, whereas the fractions, the following fractions, represent parts of an Aligai, that is the Vinadis, uh, Pala in, in Sanskrit, the so-called Indian minutes. Uh, 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 um, an Aligai corresponds to 24 minutes and a, 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 a Vinadi, a Pala, corresponds to 24 seconds. If I am right, this means that, for example, the string on top of the slide, on the left top of the slide, uh, which can be transcribed 14 ri ri tal, can be calculated as 14 naligai plus one half of an aligai plus one eighth of an aligai, that is 14.625 naligais, and the same for the other two examples. Note that I assume that the integers and the following fractions stand in an additive relationship. That is to say that a plus sign 
is must be implied between all of them um, if you have any hints in this respect please let me let us know uh, even assuming that i am right what Naliga is and Binadi's point to in a date? Well, uh, sometimes it seems clear that the Naligais and uh, their fractions have been included in the date in order to record the precise time at which the copying process came to an end. In this example, for, uh, in this example the scribe uh, says us that uh, he completed the work uh, in the column year 1002, month of Adi, day 20, on the 15th Narigai in the daytime, it is completed. So the copying process is completed. Wednesday, constellation of Punar Pushan. Uh, 15 Narigai in the daytime means 15 uh, Narigais after sunrise. That means uh, noon, exactly. Um, more, frequent, more frequently, though, it seems that the scribe, the scribe just copied the Naligais and their fractions from a Panchanga calendar. Uh, again, um, a Panchanga, the Panchangas are traditional calendars, which, uh, as the name suggests, are based on five calendrical elements. Uh, Titi, uh, Vara, the, the day of the week, Nakshatra, Yoga, and Karana. In the date which I, uh, that I have transcribed in the slide, the scribe provided amounts of Naligai in yellow, the Naligai and uh, their fractions, with reference to four calendrical elements, Nakshatra, Titi, Yoga, and Karana. As you can see in the picture on the bottom of the slide, a Panchanga records, records, sorry, records Naligais and Binadis for precisely the same four calendrical elements. It must be underlined, though, that in a Panchanga, these Naligai, you can see here, Titi, Gatika, and Pala, Nakshatra, Gatika, and Pala, these uh, Naligai and Binadis, Yoga, Gatika, and Pala, and Karana, Gatika, and Pala. Uh, in a Panchanga, these values of Naliga, Naliga, Naligais and, and Binadis indicate the exact time of expiration of each of these four calendrical elements on a specific day. In other words, it seems plausible that the scribe, while he was writing the date, had a Panchanga or, or a similar uh, calendar before him, and he copied the Naligais and the Vinadis from this calendar. Uh, in this case, Naligais and Vinadis do not point to the time when the scribe finished his work, but to the time of expiration of the calendrical elements on that day. Uh, however, the meaning and the role of the Naligais and the Vinadis in our dates require a surely further investigation, hopefully relying on a larger number of attestations. Um, it is wor worth emphasizing, oh sorry, I have already took maybe too much time, I uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, say one last thing as for panchangas uh, note that prob probably they influenced the way in which dates are recorded in the manuscripts also under another aspect uh, the standard order of the calendrical elements in a date is shown in this slide this order is followed uh, in 87 percent of the day of the cases uh, uh, which rises to 90% if we ignore the versified dates in which the order of the elements is influenced by prosodical constraints. Uh, on the right of the slide, you can see the number of misplacements of each calendrical elements, uh, element uh, with respect to the standard order. The element which is far more often misplaced is the day of the week, which accounts for almost half of the total misplacements. Uh, most of the times, 
the day of the week has been moved, when it is misplaced, it has been moved forward in the sequence between the Titi and the Nakshatra. And in all likely, this happened under the influence of the Panchangas. In a Panchanga, the five basic calendrical elements are arranged invariably in this order. Titi, Vara, Nakshatra, Yoga and Karana. So, Titi, Weekday, Nakshatra, Yoga and Karana, uh, which is, in fact, the sequence that results from the most frequent misplacement of the day of the week. Okay, I think uh, I think I finish I, uh, and hear my presentation. I close the my sharing. Okay, this that's it. Uh, I Giovanni, if you want to sure. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, okay, I will show my face one second just to uh, thank you uh, to join Marco, thanking you for having us today. And I will also try to share my uh, my PowerPoint, which of course now doesn't appear. <laughs> just a second. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Can you please confirm that you can see it in full screen? Yes, you yeah. can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Very good. Okay. So this is just a repetition of the title. Um, so I will go back now uh, to uh, the basically one slide that Marco has already shown us. Uh, that is the one of our modular approach, let's say, to the analysis of the components of the colophons, right? So we have already seen which ones uh, we may find, not in all colophons, and uh, Marco has introduced us to the complexities of the dates, which are probably, uh, or hopefully, let's say, one of a topic that may be uh, of interest to the to the audience uh, today. Um, but uh, uh, our uh, work on colophons uh, is actually uh, um, becoming a springboard for a more uh, holistic, let's say, uh, approach to the study of palm leaf manuscripts. And I will slowly uh, get to the point. Uh, first, I would like to, um, uh, to drag your attention to the fact that in the modules, we uh, do not have anything that uh, explicitly concerns places, right? Uh, because actually, uh, very, very rarely, you do find an indication of the place where the manuscript was actually copied. Most of the place names are parts, parts of the names of the scribe, the owner, or uh, other people, let's say, involved in the production and use of the manuscript. But very rarely you find a statement, an explicit statement, that tells you where the manuscript was actually copied, let's say. Uh, this one is a manuscript from the IFP, uh, and it is one of those cases. It's a very nice colophon full of information, and it tells us very explicitly that the manuscript was copied here at uh, uh, in Parani, right? Um, as I said, this is like, a, really like, a, I don't have statistics for this, but uh, we are talking about uh, maybe 10 to 20 occurrences out of uh, uh, all the manuscripts we have, uh, we have seen so far. Um, this leads to the question. Uh, so as Marco showed you, uh, date-wise, uh, we know uh, uh, that most of the manuscripts are from the 19th century. There are a few notable uh, exceptions from the 17th and the, 16th, uh, and the 18th century, uh, but most probably due also to the, uh, to the nature of the palm leaves and the way they have been stored. Uh, uh, mostly uh, surviving items are from the uh, 19th century. So one of the main research questions from the point of view of manuscript studies is not much that of dating the manuscripts, but is that of placing back, in, uh, locating back in their original place, in the place in which they were produced and maybe also in the place in which they were used, which could not does not necessarily correspond to the place where they were produced. Uh, so... Uh, in India, we do have, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, we, of course, we focus on Tamil Nadu, 
we have these huge collections of, of palm leaf manuscripts uh, in Chennai, in Pondicherry, in Tanjabur, and so forth. I have included also to, um, Trivandrum, of course, uh, although in Kerala. Um, but the problem is that we do not have uh, uh, proper records that tell us from where the manuscripts were collected. And I'm really talking about uh, sub-regions within Tamil Nadu. Of course, we know they're all from Tamil Nadu if they are written in, in Tamil script or in, Granta, in Tamilian Granta script, let's say. But where within Tamil Nadu they are from, it's very difficult to say. So if we are very lucky, we have colophones that explicitly tell us so. But as I said, these are uh, a rarity. Uh, therefore, it is very difficult to, 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 to get to know exactly from, from which village, from which temple, from which school, or simply from, from the north or the south of Tamil Nadu these manuscripts are from. Uh, so our, and this is just an example to show you, uh, this is uh, from the former venue of the Government Oriental Manuscript Library in Chennai. This is when it was in Chepak, now they moved it to, uh, to the Anna Library. Uh, and we are talking, of course, when it comes to palm leaf manuscripts, in particular in South India, we are talking about, about thousands upon tens of thousands of manuscripts, right? Uh, of course, like it's always very difficult to calculate how many manuscripts, uh, millions of manuscripts, there are only in India, let's say, if you include everything from uh, uh, palm leaf manuscripts to paper codices. Uh, and if we focus on uh, Tamil Nadu in particular, there are, of course, the, uh, the catalogs of the main libraries that tells us about, as I said, tens of thousands of items. Only in Pondicherry, there are more or less uh, 10,000 manuscripts between the IFP and the UFO. Uh, but um, as I said, the, 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 the colophons are not very explicit on the whereabouts of the manuscripts. So, uh, the, the codicological, philological analysis that Marco and I uh, carry on uh, is by the producer of the manuscript and the user of the manuscript. Uh, so if we can find uh, patterns in this paratext, we can start, uh, so the colophons, we can start group, let's say, uh, we can start divide <coughs> the, the manuscripts into meaningful groups in terms of production and usage. So if the same uh, for instance, symbol for a month is used in uh, 10 manuscripts, it is possible that those 10 manuscripts may uh, share some sort of common background in terms of like the scribal uh, milieu in which they have been produced or even the geographical location in which they have been produced. Uh, but as I, as I think Marco may have mentioned, but I will mention it again, uh, not only we have very few colophones that are explicit about places, but we have very few colophones at that in general. Uh, and a rough estimate is that we have a colophone every 10 manuscripts. So uh, even if we are able to uh, uh, divide the manuscripts that do have colophones into meaningful groups, what to do with the 90% of the manuscripts that do not have colophones, let's say. Of course, we can rely on paleography, so the study of the handwriting. But this is a complex issue, and there are limits, I would say, to that. Um, so the uh, approach that we are trying to develop here at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures in Hamburg, uh, and that does not only involve palm leaf manuscripts, but all manuscripts, uh, handwritten items, actually, so even inscriptions and so forth in general, is that of combining the philological approach with that of computer sciences and material analysis. And I will show you what we have done so far and what we are planning to do in terms of uh, uh, tackling this material, the palm leaf manuscripts, uh, from the point of view also of computer science and material analysis with questions that are informed by the philological and codicological analysis in order to know more about, as I said, the whereabouts of not only the manuscripts that have colophones, but also of manuscripts in general. Uh, because if we can match uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, let, let's say, material features uh, of manuscripts that we know they, where they are from, with material features of manuscripts that we don't explicitly know where we are from. For the latter category, we can also assume that there may be some sort of commonality. So they may come from the same place, or may they have been produced by the same people. Let's say. Um, so uh, in terms of 
uh, of manuscripts of, for, to which we have access. When it comes to uh, uh, computer sciences, let's say, we mostly work on images. And it is a fantastic thing that uh, the collections in Pondicherry, the IFP and the FEO collections have been digitized to a quality that is high enough uh, to be able to apply the methods of pattern recognition. So pattern recognition is like a branch of computer science, if you want, that uh, looks at, uh, that, that spots patterns in images uh, by means of using, um, of calculating, let's say, elaborating the distributions of the pixels and the values of the pixels. Uh, to make it very uh, straightforward, this is not OCR, because for instance, OCR has to decide whether a pixel is black or white, let's say, whereas pattern recognition, uh, uh, and, and so it doesn't convert the pixels into anything, doesn't simplify the situation, but it looks for the distribution of these pixels and of their uh, color value, let's say. Uh, so that means that uh, we are not looking for words, but we're looking for uh, for, for, for patterns, like hand-drawn patterns, let's say. And one, once with, uh, while with Marco, we were looking for colophons across the manuscripts uh, in general and of the IFP and FAO in particular, we found a number of occurrences of this thing at the bottom. This is like a squared uh, way of writing what you have here at the top, which is simply the invocation Hari He Om. This Hari He Om here, written in standard Granta, it's very common and there's nothing sp special about that. This one here, which is, you, I will show you, it is the same thing actually, uh, just in a different hand style, we would say, it's very rare. And, uh, or we thought it was extremely rare. So, uh, and as I will show you later, but it is not, uh, that rare in the end. Uh, this is just a stroke conversion to show you that we are talking, that it's true that these two things are the same. Uh, you have to use a little bit of imagination to uh, twist and bend the lines, let's say, but uh, these two uh, images both read Harihi and, and Om, of course. Uh, so when with Marco we were looking for colophons, we found in the FAO collection, and of course, like we go, uh, basically, in order to, to spot these things, one would have to go uh, image by image. Uh, we found two, right? In, over like, I don't know, maybe six years that we were working together and 21 uh, in the IFP. Thanks to the, uh, so, uh, the the algorithm and then the software developed here at the center by Dr. Uh, um, Hussein Adnan Mohammed, uh, who is a, a computer scientist devoted to, to, to developing new tools uh, to, um, to the study of manuscripts and handwritten artifacts in general. Uh, he, he developed, he was, uh, let's say we collaborated and he developed uh, an algorithm and then a software, which is freely available by the way, uh, on the website of our center uh, for you to, to play with. Uh, and he went uh, automatically, let's say through uh, uh, all the images, of the manuscripts of the FAO and the IFP. And as you can see, we are talking about uh, thousands and thousands of images. Sorry, I don't have the total computation of the images of the IFP, but you can see that it is like 8,500 and more and counting manuscripts. Uh, and he found at least six more at the FAO and 50 more at the IFP in, uh, in I think one day and a half his computer took uh, to, to, to do so. Compared to the six years in which we found only two and 21 together with Marco. Then given the nature of the collection of the IFP in which manuscripts have been probably bought in, 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 uh, in lots, uh, I searched for, um, according to the, to the entry uh, in, in the, uh, to the library, num basically the, the shelf number of the manuscripts, I looked for uh, each occurrence found by, uh, by, by us and by uh, my colleague, uh, Hussein Mohammed. Uh, I, I looked for 10 manuscripts before and 10 manuscripts after, and I could find 38 more uh, occurrences of this Harion. This to, to show you that uh, it, is, um, it is true that probably manuscripts that have been bought, to get, uh, bought at the same time, in the same lot, and therefore probably come from the same place, they share certain features, let's say. So this goes back to the, our idea of patterns. And this is much, uh, that this is just our case for, for computer sciences. If we move to material analysis, of course, uh, when it comes to South Indian manuscripts, what we have is mostly the leaves, 
Maybe if we want to count the wooden boards and the cotton threads, but these are substituted probably very often, so uh, they may not be historically uh, very telling. And the suit, the suit which is used to write, uh, to, to not to write, sorry, but to to, to ink the manuscript because the writing is doing by by scratching, right? Uh, but the, the 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 inking is doing by smearing suit, which is combined with the binding, and there are. Uh, uh, various accounts of what binding is used to keep the suit together, basically, as well as there are several accounts of how the leaves of the manuscripts are produced. We know more or less from the literature which are the palm trees from which manuscripts are taken, but how the leaves are cured, are prepared to host writing, we do have uh, different accounts. And therefore, if we are able to uh, um, identified specific features of the leaves in the way they have been, let's say, the, 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 the marks of how they have been processed and certain properties of the suit, and we will see the suit does not surprisingly contain only carbon as one could expect. Um, if we can identify these values, let's say, for manuscripts for which we have colophons, we know and we know colophones and we don't have explicit information about their whereabouts, we can still uh, uh, extrapolate material information and therefore match them with the, uh, with the other set of manuscripts and assume and postulate that they may share a similar background. Uh, there are a number of techniques that are applied here in Hamburg, uh, which go from uh, DNA sequencing and then the study of more complex molecules. So these are the disciplines of proteomics and metabolomics. And then we have microscopy, of course, that looks at the very small, and spectroscopy that looks at how light uh, um, interacts with elements that are in the material analyzed. Um, I give you two examples. Uh, so these are uh, the portable machines. So these are usually uh, like Raman spectrography. It's a very huge machine that takes up the space of one room, let's say. But uh, in the portable versions have been developed. They are slightly less powerful, of course, but they can be brought around. So here in Hamburg, we have a set of these portable machines. We are testing all of them to see which kind of information we can retrieve from the analysis of palm leaf manuscripts, of which luckily we have a huge collection here in, in, uh, in the university library, uh, like around four to 500 items. Um, and so far we have uh, uh, discovered that XRF, Yes, so the machine here, the, the one, uh, the third one in the slide, uh, does in fact yield. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we don't see the slides, or just I don't see the slides? Uh, okay. Uh, Is anybody else have any stuff? Yeah, me neither. Me neither. It says that. Uh, the connection is uh, not good, so... Uh, okay. From the beginning of the presentation or from... Or no, now? no, no, no. Just a minute ago. Sorry? From a minute ago? Ah, okay, okay, very good, okay. Uh, maybe I, I can... see everything. Okay. Uh, any suggestions? Should I... Maybe... Maybe stop sharing and resharing? Yeah, just uh, rejoin the meeting. It should be fine. Ah, okay, so and I should get out. No, not Giovanni. Okay. Whoever's no. having a problem. Ah, I see, I see. Here. Okay. <laughs> I had the problem earlier. I exited and rejoined. It started working again. Ah, okay, thanks, Giovanni. Okay. okay, so I will do that. Thank you. Okay, I will wait for you. <laughs> uh, but now I have to reshare, right? Because I have unshared the screen. Maybe I should switch off my camera as well in case it. Is a problem. Um, okay. So again, I hope you can you have the full view. Yes. Yes. yes okay. Thank you. I have no idea why the image of the Raman spectroscopy disappeared, but that doesn't matter because we are using XRF, so this big gray one in the middle. Uh, we have tested it on uh, a first batch of manuscripts that actually belong not to the university library, but to the Center for the Study of Manuscript Studies itself. Uh, this one is, uh, if I, so the, the one in the picture is actually a Tamil one. The one that we are, uh, on which you see the, the, uh, the analysis being performed is probably an Indonesian one 
upside down. Um, Anyway, it doesn't matter in the sense that uh, we have tested uh, one from Indonesia, one from Sri Lanka, one from Tamil Nadu, and one from Kerala. Uh, and for all of them, we have noticed that uh, we had different profiles, right, in the terms of the composition of the suit. Just before I go to the composition, let me go back. If the slide goes back, yes. Uh, this is how it works, right? There is like a laser pointed to the uh, the spot. Of course, the laser is calibrated, so it, does, it doesn't burn the the, 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 the the leaf. And actually, these are all non-invasive techniques, so we don't really even touch the object. Uh, the laser moves over from, from before, let's say, the, the written part to over the written part, and you can see that as the the, the, the laser moves, uh, the, the 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 interaction with the with the light changes, and you have uh, results for the elemental composition of the suit, right? So not only carbon, which I haven't even marked here, but we also have titanium, iron, and mercury. Uh, and uh, all the four manuscripts that I mentioned, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Indonesia, Java in particular, uh, sorry, uh, Bali, uh, and, uh, and Sri Lanka, they all have a slightly different profile. So it is possible that um, uh, we can use the, 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 the elemental composition of the suit to know more about uh, uh, specific items or groups of items and link this information to uh, known uh, geographical information. And this is something that has been done uh, for many years by now uh, on, while studying, uh, for instance, Western or Islamic manuscripts. Uh, this is just one example from some of the colleagues here at the center, in particular, Dr. Ira Rabin and Professor Dr. Oliver Hahn. Um, uh, for instance, it, it was discovered that uh, while, while analyzing inks, and of course this kind of analysis is much easier when we have liquid inks because they are chemically much more complex, um, um, it was possible to, 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 um, to notice that uh, the amount of zinc in the ink used in a particular location in Germany in a particular time frame was uh, unusually high. And after studying several manuscripts uh, from this region and other regions, it was clear that uh, the ink the, the ink found in those manuscripts had a very particular uh, geographical uh, provenance. And therefore, manuscripts for which we have doubts whether they are from that area or not, or that period of time or not, we can, through the analysis of, uh, of the ink, be sure whether it is the case or not. And hopefully, we could do do something similar by analyzing the suit in the South Indian manuscripts, in particular the Tamil uh, ones. Uh, this is another machine uh, which is unfortunately not transportable because we have machines also here that we use for analysis and that are not transportable. Uh, this is an atomic force microscope, uh, microscope uh, that um, basically can map uh, the surface of objects to the almost atomic level uh, without touching it. It's just like a there is this kind of pin, very, very tiny pin, which is called the cantilever, which uh, interacts with the atomic forces, basically, and moves up and down, just thus giving us, basically, a mapping of the surface. And uh, with this technique, we are looking for the traces left by different methods of producing the leaves. Um, so, yeah, uh, there are... In, let's say the the, num the sky is the limit. The number of research questions that one can ask by combining the philological approach, the uh, computer science approach, and the uh, material analysis approach is uh, giant. Um, and of course, like in in this context, I would like to uh, underline how important it would be to be able to uh, spot maybe a meaningful number of manuscripts that are available. Uh, for scrutiny in Pondicherry or in Tamil Nadu in general, uh, and we can ask uh, meaningful historical and geographical questions, let's say, about the whereabouts of the production and the use, or uh, we can get to know more about the scribes and the owners, let's say, and, and this kind of questions, let's say. Uh, maybe manuscripts containing uh, mathematical texts or um, similar topics that are of interest to this research group. And I'm saying this because although the machines are here now in Hamburg, for 2023, uh, so I will skip this example, we are planning uh, the first mission of what is the brand new container lab 
of the Center for the Study of Manuscript Culture. So we, as I showed you before, we do have transportable machines that have been shipped uh, not only in Europe, but also uh, in a, to other continents. For instance, we were in Nepal, I think, maybe nine to eight years ago. Uh, but now we have stepped up in a way, and we have been uh, just uh, uh, finished, let's say, um, manufacturing this uh, uh, new container lab, which is made of uh, six uh, half containers, uh, five of which here in the picture are the labs in which you can do wet chemistry. So DNA analysis, metabolomics and proteomics. And some of other, uh, some of the, 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 the rest of the space can be used to host the portable machine like the XRF uh, I was showing you before. And these containers can be easily is a big word, but let's say relatively easily shipped uh, really be on a, on a boat, let's say, all over the world. And uh, now that they have been, so this picture here with the crane is from last week. Uh, they have been delivered uh, just now, basically. Uh, we are uh, deciding now which machines exactly to put inside because by uh, January 2023, we want to be in Pondicherry and the IFP uh, is going to be our hosting institution there and not only our hosting institution, but actually, actually our research partner. Um, and uh, we will be there hopefully for around eight months, uh, looking at IFP and hopefully also FAO manuscripts on the basis of the uh, research questions that came out from the, the analysis that Marco and I did through the years over the colophons in order to try to uh, combine our results with results from uh, material analysis again, to know more, uh, to, to um, extrapolate patterns and therefore know more about uh, the history, the origin, the use of hopefully and potentially each individual uh, manuscript. Of course, we are talking about if maybe a few hundreds out of the thousands available, but it would be very important to be able to show that this is doable, let's say. And then we can actually ask intelligent questions and get meaningful answers. And uh, yeah, this is just a summary of the whole thing with the final picture in which you can see how we do uh, DNA analysis that I haven't mentioned. So we, with a nylon swab, you just uh, gently rub the surface and remove molecules. So again, this is not completely, um, how can I say, uh, non-invasive, but we call it like minimally invasive in the sense that uh, uh, even with a microscope, it would be difficult to see uh, that some molecules have been taken away from the object, let's say. So all the techniques that we use are uh, harmless to the manuscripts. And this is, of course, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Giovanni and Marco. Uh, uh, we're open for questions now. Anyone? Okay, here, Thomas. Uh, I would have a, a few questions about the material uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your presentation, there was a, you were talking about the soil on which the palm trees grows. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So that's it, that traces of like uh, phytolith or what the. Uh, what are the markers you're looking for in uh, that case? Um, so this was actually, uh, it's an excellent question, but unfortunately I am not the right person to answer it because we would need some colleagues from uh, botany. Uh, because as, as you can imagine, this is a very um, uh, complex enterprise that uh, requires a, a number of colleagues. And uh, But uh, I, I can tell you more or less what is the principle, which probably you already have uh, understood, is that uh, in, in order to have a better profiling of, um, of the available plants, in theory, it would be good to have samples of the soil to see what the plants were feeding from, basically. Uh, but whether we can actually do that once we are in India and we can do it to a meaningful extent in order to... Um, uh, to know more about uh, of the plants is still an open question, to be honest. That's why uh, I, th I think it was in square brackets, right? Because it's uh, really like a, a point that needs more development. I had uh, uh, another question about the ink. Uh, and you were giving the, this uh, European example. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the ink was always 
very locally produced and used. There was no market of that uh, ink, uh, ink produced in one specific area was used there, or it could be uh, sold and, and used? In uh, I, I get, uh, this is also a very good question. I guess, it I mean, everything is possible in the sense that it depends uh, in which epoch we are talking about and which geographical area we are talking about. But to my knowledge, when it comes to pre-modern cultures, broadly understood, uh, uh, inks were mostly produced by the scribes themselves. And uh, you have recipes uh, moving around on how to make inks, uh, in particular liquid inks. Um, when it comes to uh, modern times, of course, we have like industrially made inks that are anyway used for uh, manuscripts and then maybe yes okay th there is a market for that when it comes to the suit in particular for 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 our manuscripts the palm leaf manuscripts uh, i would be very surprised if there was a market for that because this is something you can in theory produce relatively easy uh, with, with an uh, with an oil lamp basically uh, and probably the, the 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 element the extra elements apart from carbon that are found there depend on either the lamp that was used or the uh, the stylus that was used to uh, I'm sorry not the stylus the the um, the the the, the um, the piece of cloth that was used to smear the suit and of course the binding although the binding is probably like an organic material and, and doesn't leave traces that are uh, detectable with the uh, a machine such such as xrf that i showed you before and the last question about the dna you're looking for uh, any dna of the plant or the elements of the suit or even of the scribe or uh, what, uh, what uh, so uh, there is both the analysis of the uh, of the dna of the so my main uh, how can i say from my point of view so the, from the point of view of of the humanities <laughs> which i <laughs> Uh, my main interest would be to know, to have a better idea uh, of the DNA of the plant, so of the leaf, because I hope that even if we know that all the manuscripts are made either of talipot or uh, palmyra, let's say, still you, it is potentially possible to to find subfamilies of these trees. Let's say maybe one is uh, only from North Sri Lanka, one is only from let's say Tirunelveli, one is only from Arcot. I don't know if it is possible, but that would be. Uh, very helpful for the kind of questions I have concerning the manuscripts. As far as my co colleagues from DNA analysis, the, the first research question they have is whether their methods do work on the palm leaves, because sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. And their research question is exact. So they are from the field of uh, DNA analysis slash archaeometry, which are these scientific methods for, for archaeological, let's say, uh, and, and we do archaeology of the book in a way. Um, they uh, uh, they managed to extrapolate DNA from certain samples of, of, of palm leaf manuscripts, so not only the fresh leaf, but the actual manuscript. But sometimes this method doesn't work. And we have to understand why. It could be because of uh, the lemongrass oil that is smeared on the top. This is, for now, a hypothesis that has to be tested. That's why it's very important in Hamburg, we have a number of manuscripts that have not been inked. Therefore, I assume they have never been smeared with uh, uh, lemongrass oil. And we should see if there we can actually uh, retrieve DNA from the leaf. Then there is the environmental DNA, let's say, which can be simply the insects, the dirt, or any human trace left uh, uh, on the leaf. It happened, in fact, for European manuscripts that it was possible to retrieve human DNA. So we have samples of the DNA of uh, mid middle medieval Italian monks who copied and, and maybe sweated or cried over the manuscript, let's say. Uh, given the nature of our manuscript, uh, uh, this is mm, difficult to expect. Uh, and uh, but they will again look whether it is possible or not. Uh, but they will look also for environmental DNA. But my, from my point of view, what is most important is the DNA of the leaf itself. Let's say. Any other questions? Yes, Roy. Hi, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, presentation. I learned a lot. 
Um, my question is about uh, the number of hands that are involved in a bundle. Uh, so first, did you try to make some sort of analysis how many people are involved in the copying of a single bundle or even a single manuscript? Um, uh, whether, uh, what's the relation between the hand that wrote the colophon to the hands that were involved in uh, other parts of the bundle? Uh, whether it can tell us something about the culture or circumstances of copy, copying, uh, whether it is something more um, uh, uh, done for others by professional copiers or whether it is uh, some sort of local collaborative or personal initiative. Um, I don't, Marco, do you, maybe you want to answer this one, or is you are okay. the paleographer? <laughs> uh, well, the number of hands of people who contributed to the to writing a, a manuscript can differ uh, can differ uh, from one bundle to another, uh, and from the it depends on the nature of the of the bundle. Um, sometimes a bundle is made up of one single text, some other uh, times a manuscript is a, a multi-text manuscript or a composite manuscript, and in, especially in the last case, composite means that the manuscript, uh, the bundle was, is made up of uh, texts uh, originally uh, uh, written for uh, different uh, from the, by different scribes and probably originally they belong to different bundles but at some point for some reasons they were uh, joined together in a new bundle uh, for example the, because the, the, of the topic because of the common topic of this text uh, if you have a, a, a this kind of bundle, a composite manuscript, of course you expect to have many people who contributed to writing the, the different texts. Uh, if you have a, a single text manuscript, manuscript um, usually you have uh, one single hand, I mean most of the time you have one single hand at work, one single scribe, and uh, um, and the scribe, if the colophon is written at the end of the text, the scribe is the same scribe, is one single scribe who wrote both the text and the colophon. Of course, if the colophon is, for example, scratched on the wooden board, uh, it is not rare the case when uh, that scribe was a different scribe. Because, for example, uh, in some, some examples, we have that uh, the, it was the owner, a new a secondary or, uh, owner, who uh, bought the bundle and then wrote his name and some other annotation, annotations on the wooden board. In that case, of course, who wrote on the wooden board is a different person uh, with respect to the one who wrote the text. And uh, other examples, I mean, I, I was thinking, for example, sometimes uh, a single uh, folio or um, several folios of a manuscript uh, uh, are, are, are lost or broken, and so they had to rewrite and replace with new folios. In that case, again, we, you can see that uh, another scribe, wrote the new folios which were uh, inserted in the manuscript to substitute the uh, lost uh, uh, folios. Um, I don't know if I, I, if I have answered your question. I mean, the, 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 reconstruction, the reconstruction of the process of copying and of the... Um, of the... Uh, let's say uh, yeah of the process of copying is one of the aims of the aims of our research but it is 
I must say it's quite difficult. I mean, we, we, we are trying and we are success, successful in this sometimes. We are trying to reconstruct families of scribes because uh, uh, in, the, in some colophons, the scribe uh, tells us that his name, but also his father's name and his grandfather's name and a date, the date when he completed the work. And we, uh, we could find manuscripts written uh, by the scribe, but also by his father and also by his grandfather and also by uh, a brother. So in this sense, we are trying to reconstruct these this, uh, families of scribes. If this is possible. Uh, far more difficult is to reconstruct uh, groups of uh, scribes, for example, on the basis of uh, uh, places, because places is one uh, of the big uh, uh, obscure points uh, in our research. Um, sometimes we can suppose that uh, two scribes work together because their ductus, the way they write, is extremely similar, even though they are not relatives uh, as soon as, as, uh, uh, as uh, we know. Um, uh, so the, 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 the reconstruction of the, of the process of production and circulation of the manuscript is uh, what, um, one of uh, our uh, main goals. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress, and and, uh, and uh, it's a kind of a difficult one. Yeah. yeah uh, thank you for the just a quick follow up. Uh, so um, I, I think quite a few manuscripts where people collaborate on the copying or uh, on transcribing from uh, reading. It's not clear if it is read or actually copied. Um, and uh, it might, of course, be a complete artifact of the text that I'm, using, I'm looking at because I don't have any sort of representative sample. I'm also looking at the Kerala Malayali text. Um, but one thing that might come to mind is that perhaps uh, texts uh, with colophons are more likely to be the work of a single scribe, whereas texts without might be a little more likely to be collaborative because then who is writing the colophon, who is going to identify as the scribe. Uh, so uh, it might be interesting to uh, to sample some text without colophon and see how often the, there's a change of hand there as opposed to um, uh, text with colophons. If I can add in that respect, uh, I see your point, uh, but... Um... There are two things to mention, probably. One is that most of the manuscripts we are dealing with, they contain uh, well-known texts to a certain extent, uh, literary religious texts for which there are several copies. And they are a little less idiosyncratic, I would say, in the way they are produced. So they are usually commissioned, probably. And therefore, uh, I would expect that it is the same scribe. It's, most, most, it's more probable that it is the same scribe and uh, the same uh, or the same family of scribes, is it the same scriptorium that is working on it? Although it is true, as Marco also mentioned, that sometimes the hand changes clearly, let's say, and, and so there, there are different hands. Uh, in terms of matching this research question with material analysis, one thing uh, we will hopefully do already this summer here in Hamburg, there are uh, a few uh, manuscripts in which not only the hand changes, but the script changes inside the manuscript when it comes to the same text. So it's the same text written in Telugu. I, 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 I know these cases to changing from Granta to Kolaruto, for example. Exactly. And then my, my question is, is it the same person? Well, in okay, from Granta, from Malayalam Granta to Kolaruto, maybe, who knows, like it could be the same person. But from uh, from, from Telugu to Nandinagari or from Granta to, to Telugu, in the same text, so from, from a, a, like a page of the Mahabharata to the next page, let's say, uh, uh, I don't know if you also have this kind of cases. Uh, in that case, uh, I really wonder whether material analysis can help us confirm whether it is the same ink, uh, at least uh, with the same suit or not. Uh, and therefore it is the same person or not. 
uh, or possibly, let's say. But yes, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I find your 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 um, research questions very um, meaningful, also for the, for the kind of uh, of investigation that we do. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question uh, in that same idea uh, with this uh, pattern recognition and the uh, use of computers is there uh, some gra uh, graphological uh, analysis possible and that, that would help recognize different scribes or different school of writing and all this in the, in the, the same colleague who produced the one the, the software that I, I will actually if you give me a second I will I will share the link uh, in the chat so uh, you all have an easier and faster access to it. He also developed a, a, a software for, uh, and it's not really hand recognition, but it's hand comparison, because this is what can be actually done. So he can give you statistic, uh, statistical values for how much certain hands are similar to each other than others. Uh, where is it? Mm, software, yeah, this. And I really, really uh, strongly recommend you to, to, to have a look at uh, what is possible with the softwares. And you can always get in touch with the author of the softwares himself, who is uh, always looking forward to uh, collaborate and test his methods further let's say, with new materials. So if you open... Uh, you have all the, so there, there are several software. Some are like to help uh, analyzing uh, data that are extrapolated by machines. One is about uh, paper making, let's say, but the first two are those that uh, can be applied for uh, uh, also in our case. The first one is the one that uh, I showed you before and we published also about it. So the, soft, the, the, the algorithm is uh, publicly available and the software is here for everybody. And the other one that compares the hands is the second one. This is a visual pattern detector, let's say, that gives you um, um, an easy to use software, as it says, to, to compare hands, let's say. Of course, it doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you, uh, according to the question you ask, it gives you a numerical value, let's say, to, to orientate yourself. Uh, can you please share the link uh, with Babu and with us uh, after the talk? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. The link uh, is could you uh, share? in the chat box, right? Uh, we will also share it to us. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other uh, questions? Benoit, uh, you raised a hand or is it just saying okay to the... I'm just wondering, it's not clear to me. I was just saying okay for the. I, I could uh, see the presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's for sure. Anybody else would like to raise any more issues? Okay. So thank you, uh, Giovanni and Marco. It was quite uh, useful. As you could see, that uh, several. Uh, uh, I mean, people have been struggling with this question of, as you know, uh, when studying the manuscripts, especially in relation to connecting to the previous uh, talk on the webinar series that we had by uh, Serafina Kumo, who works on uh, Greco-Roman manuscripts and uh, inscriptions. And uh, she's currently thinking about deploying the distributed cognition framework uh, in order to see how accretion and uh, cumulative nature of some of the compilations, which kind of provides particular characteristics to knowledge formation and knowledge cultures in the thing, you know. So how do we then relate it to the material cultures of manuscript production, the places in which they were produced, and the nature of the circulation that you are uh, trying to... So uh, hopefully we'll be able to complement each other's work through these kind of, uh, you know, bringing the material, that's one. And also, lot of uh, every uh, five to six years there is a new generation of scholars coming in and studying the same set of manuscripts asking different set of questions therefore uh, i think i think uh, some of the fundamental questions remain about particularly pertaining to the realms of circulation and the place of production and the context in which uh, these things come up and uh, i was just wondering if there is a 
definite assumption between the institutional and the uh, informal in the way the manuscripts are sort to be produced so if you ascribe it to the monastery and the school uh, then the nature of the uh, orientation and content of some of the texts that we are talking about are markedly very different uh, for instance we have been able to find that uh, in some of the su southern tamil nadu villages where uh, in a particular village like nallithevan patti near uh, this thing we found almost every alternate household uh, had a copy of the enchuvadi so which is to say that you know so if you have to draw a lineage to if did everyone go to a particular tinai school you know which happened to be a brahmin village next door and then you know so we have been trying to trace the story of that so somewhere so if it's a place of production is the school but if the place of production is the workplace itself like you know what happens at the desk when when someone is writing down certain things like you have it in the case of the revenue accounts manuscripts or uh, some of the professional occupational manuals that you are uh, finding out so then you bring in the realm of occupation and the place of learning together then what have what kind of new insights could material analysis provide is something that we could also uh, think about i think that's what so sure, I, i i look forward to 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 think together more about what kind of uh, questions we can ask let's say uh, combining all these approaches yes yeah so thank you so much once again for uh, participating in a webinar and accepting our invitation it was definitely useful and looking forward to uh, interact more on this uh, issue thank you marco and thank you giovanni and thank you everyone else for uh, being part of this bye thank you for having us here and to the audience of course <laughs>